Olá, obrigado a todos por estarem a assistir a esta primeira entrevista que gravamos uh, com um convidado internacional, uh, muitos provavelmente conhecerão, Johan Norberg, é um historiador e intelectual público sueco, uh, conhecido por defender ideias de, relacionadas com o mercado livre e com o capitalismo. Uh, é um professor universitário, realizador de documentários e escritor de renome internacional, Senior Fellow no Cato Institute, Washington DC e no Centro Europeu para a Economia Política Internacional em Bruxelas. É também comentador habitual nos médias suecos e internacionais, escreve uma coluna semanal no principal jornal diário da Suécia, o Metro, e é residente em Malmo, sendo que tem um livro publicado em língua portuguesa, o Progresso, 10 razões para ter esperança no futuro. Hello, Johan. But once again, we want to address you our feelings of, of thank you for being here. It's a, a very important discussion I think we're going to have about the current matters that we are facing today. Uh, before we thank start, you for inviting me. Before we start, uh, I would like you, I already made an introduction to you in Portuguese, but I could be saying something wrong. Polish, so I'll give you the opportunity to introduce yourself and a little bit of what your your ideas are and what you're mostly known as a as a public intellectual. So if you wanted to start, please. Well, thank you. I am a um, freelance author and lecturer with a background in the his in history and specifically the history of ideas. And I'm affiliated with the think tanks both in Washington DC and in Brussels. And what I do is that I, I write my books, I do my lectures, I do documentary films, and they all have one common theme. I'm obsessed with human progress because uh, early on what I uh, learned in history and from my travels around the world is that not everybody gets the same chances uh, to get uh, a good life, uh, individual freedom and a growing economy. And But it depends on the institutions and it depends on the openness of uh, societies. And uh, that's what I learned what I'm doing research about and what I write about, how when we liberate people and give opportunities for people to be more innovative, to experiment with new ideas and new business models and new technologies, they come up with amazing achievements that surprise us all. And that's my mission to expand that uh, freedom. So fighting for open societies, free market and uh, trade around the world. And that's a, a novel fight in itself, of, obviously, and that's why we invited you, because uh, I don't know if you're aware, we are a recent political party in Portugal. Uh, we defend uh, also uh, liberalism in every sense, so uh, political liberalism, economic liberalism, social liberalism, and it's something that in Portugal wasn't, uh, Portugal didn't exist before, and we are start, we already have a, um, uh, a member of our party in the parliament, and we want to increase our representation both nationally and in the European Parliament, obviously. So we yes. are very, <laughs> we're very excited to having you here and uh, help our members also understanding a little bit more about uh, political liberalism and the ideas of, of freedom and, and liberty in itself. So Yes, I've heard about the party and I'm impressed by what I hear and I think Oh, really? Portugal that's needs that's it, nice. and I, and I think that Europe needs more liberalism in Portugal as well. So I wish you good luck. Oh, thanks a lot, Johan. Uh, so the theme of our conversation is about uh, the way uh, states tend to infringe on people, people liber personal liberties, in times of crisis, such as what we have seen with uh, the COVID pandemic. Uh, I think before we start with the specific of the COVID pandemic, we perhaps wanted to discuss a little bit more of what is the action of the state in principle in times of, uh, of, of uh, emergency. So I would start with a small and provocatory uh, quote by, I'm, I'm sure we, you have heard it about a quote of H.L. Mencken that said that the urge to save humanity is almost a false front for the urge to rule. 
I I don't know if you if you agree on that 100 with the, the quote, but I think we will start for, from there. Yes, I think that uh, Mencken had a point. Uh, to introduce my own framework, I think that human progress is based on openness, the fact that we uh, make connections uh, for mutual gains with uh, our neighbors and with strangers and with foreigners. That's why we've come so far. We trade, we constantly exchange favors, ideas, technologies, goods and services, and that's why we can make much more than when we're isolated. Uh, so that is one trajectory in human history. We constantly expand and we venture out into the unknown and come up with new innovations that make us all stronger and better off for it. But in times of crisis, we often have the opposite trajectory. We become afraid of the world. Uh, there's almost like a fight or flight instinct that is triggered. The one we see with animals who fear for their lives, we see that on a societal basis for humans as well. When there is a crisis, say, Great Depression or natural disaster, times of conflict and pandemics, we see how people retreat. They want to hide behind walls and big governments. They want a strong man to protect them against these fears. And uh, the politicians are only, <laughs> they're very willing to oblige and, um, and then dismantle many of the freedoms that we have. That's why we see a growth of governments often in times of crisis. The problem is that uh, that is not, you can understand where it comes from. Uh, it's our uh, traditional fear of uh, disasters of uh, other raiding tribes and so on. But that's not how we deal with disasters nowadays in a complex world. We do it by giving people, as many people as possible, as large freedoms as possible to improvise according to where they are, using their local knowledge to uh, make their lives better, to uh, make sure, for example, that supply chains function, even though there is lots of turmoil in the world, so that uh, they constantly tweak manufacturing processes, they reroute supplies when things change. We need that flexibility, and that only comes from people who have freedom to exploit their local knowledge, not when we have one guy up on top of government telling everybody what to do, pointing us all in the right direction, because what happens if he points us in the wrong direction? Uh, that's, and that's often what happens in times of crisis. Uh, yeah, uh, sure. But uh, what, another thing that happens, I think you also must have heard it, uh, especially in the beginnings of the, the, the pandemic, is that the the, the, the fast spread of COVID around the world was uh, an indic indic indictment of how globalism and uh, free markets had failed because people were traveling freely without uh, being being stopped by at the borders or being being screened at the borders and that in a way meant that this was a failure of globalism and of, of free markets around the world. How would you respond to that? Well, the interesting thing is that, yes, we hear that from many intellectuals and politicians who dislike liberalism, but when you talk to health experts, they often say the opposite. They say that it's a natural instinct to shut everything down in times of crisis, but it often complicates uh, matters because what happens is that you only shut down borders when the transmission is already going on. That's when you have this political urge to do it. So for example, the European Union shut its external borders at precisely the same moment Europe was the epicenter in the world of the disease. So uh, it rarely has an important effect uh, on, on the disease transmission, but what it does is that it makes it more difficult to get important supplies, to get health, workers across borders. Uh, often historically it meant that people uh, were stopped at the border creating large masses of people in the same places, which is exactly what we want to avoid uh, during uh, pandemics. So I, I don't uh, buy that. Obviously there is this effect. When we travel around the world, we also carry bacteria and viruses along the way. But that has always been the case. That was the case when it came to um, the, the Black Death in the 14th century as well. So that's not, not anything new with globalization. 
it happens a little bit faster uh, nowadays, but uh, once upon a time, we couldn't fight back. Now we can fight back because of openness and globalization. The fact that we can cooperate across borders, uh, constantly exchange information uh, between researchers, pharmaceutical companies, and come up with new solutions uh, that we couldn't do before. And then we also need this movement across the world. It's interesting that the first successful vaccine we had, the pharma, uh, the Pfizer BioNTech uh, virus, a combination of this German and this American company, they could only do it because they had corporate jets so that they could fly genetic material across the Atlantic when governments had shut down the airlines. Yes, that's, that's actually a, a great example of how uh, the free market in itself was able to provide with a, a, a quick solution. I mean, I'm sure no one was counting at the beginning that we have a vaccine in what, eight, eight nine months time which was a, an amazing achievement of, of human capacity, obviously. And, but what we already see now is that even with the vaccine, already people are saying that they're not coming fast enough, they're not uh, being produced at a, at a sufficient rate. We're already asking, especially here in Portugal, for, for the patents to be uh, available to everyone. And someone are asking already to, for the army to produce it. So even in, it seems that even when capitalism uh, triumphs, it, it's never enough or it's not even yeah. seen as a triumph in itself, obviously. So um, this, this seems to be like a, a recurring theme, right? That uh, the free market does, does, doesn't always seem to, to make the perfect uh, solution, but the state, never makes the perfect solution, but somehow is the, the best solution. So there seems to be a sort of bias about the, the way the state acts. I don't know if you would care to comment on that. Yes, people often compare what um, the real difficult world of, of free markets and a sort of utopian vision of what the government could have done if it had perfect information and did everything right. And obviously we can all make theoretical scenarios about how everything could have been perfect, but that's not what we should compare it with. We should compare it with real life politicians and bureaucrats and the decisions that they would have made. And then what we see historically is that one of the reasons why it takes such a long time to come up with responses, uh, to come up with medical drugs and treatments, is that we have approval processes that take eternities. And one of the reasons why it has gone so fast now is that they have opened up and liberalized a little bit and made sure that uh, uh, they could move quicker when it comes to vaccines. And then I would say, I mean, I agree it takes to long a time. I would have wished that it has gone even faster. But look, it's the fastest speed at which we have ever moved, ever. In, it took 3,000 years to come up with a vaccine against smallpox. But now this time around, it took three months until we had four different vaccines in clinical trials. And within a year, people were starting to get vaccinated. And then what people forget as well is that it's not as simple as just getting everything to the right place. It's an enormous logistical challenge to do this. And the only reason why it works as quickly as it does is that global capitalism has built supply chains of trucks and container ships and harbors uh, and uh, cool chains so that we can store these vaccines that are in place every day to make sure that we get cell phones and food to the right shelf in the right shop at exactly the right moment. And this time, as one expert in logistics put it, shipping all these vaccines out there, this is like uh, shipping every cell phone that has ever been produced at the same time all over the world. It's an amazing achievement. And I think we should look at why it works uh, rather than why sometimes in some areas it doesn't go as quickly as it would have done in a theoretical scenario. Obviously, because what happens, and I, I think that as a, 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 a liberal that's uh, also defending uh, liberal ideas here in my home country, what happens is that sometimes it's very hard to explain uh, our complex uh, decentralized system like the uh, global market works 
almost, uh, I mean, not almost, but exactly without being managed from the top, from a, a, a central bureaucratic uh, body. And, uh, and that's very hard to explain because it almost works in a counterintuitive way to what we are used to think, right? So that uh, everything has to be decided top down, we need a, a strong bureaucracy, a, a strong uh, body of, of uh, public officials telling us how to proceed, how, how to act. And, uh, and that's a very, I think you also may have, may have you mostly have found that, uh, that uh, challenge to explain how a decentralized and uncoordinated, but actually coordinated system works, right? And that's an incredibly important point. And this is, I think, one of the reasons why it's always easier to be a statist authoritarian, because you can just say, oh, there's a problem. I will solve it. If you give me power, I will just fix it. Whether we as liberals say, here's a problem. If we liberate millions of people, with millions of eyeballs looking at that problem, the chance is greater that someone will come up with a solution and uh, work hard to, to fix it. Uh, because that doesn't sound as safe. You know, we are tribalists. We're waiting for this big man to say that I've got the solution. I will fix this. Um, so it is counterintuitive. It sounds strange that why would strangers and, and greedy capitalists fix our problems? But the proof is in the uh, in the pudding. The proof is in the evidence. We can just compare what happens when we give people freedom to experiment with different solutions and when there is one government trying to tell everybody what to do. Because what happens is that you liberate more energy, more local knowledge on how to fix things. Take, for example, the fact that we had too few, too little protective equipment during this uh, crisis in, in Europe, too few face masks. And that goes for everybody. It's not just that we had too little local production. You know, China had uh, an enormous face mask production, but they had to import 2 billion face masks in the first month because demand increased 20 fold. So that goes for everybody. The interesting thing is, what do you do then? Well, governments, they tried to ban exports of what little production they had. Uh, France and Germany tried to stop face masks uh, being exported to um, Southern Europe when this happened. Uh, and that was a disaster. It just meant that it didn't end up where people needed them. What did capitalists do? They understood that there was suddenly a demand for new face masks. So in just two months, the number of companies that produced face masks in Europe increased from 12 companies to more than 500 companies. And that only worked because it was decentralized. Uh, it only worked because they had their local knowledge about what can we do with these machines, with these assembly lines, the product, the, the raw material we have at hand, and the workers who are still here when so many are off sick. Uh, and what can we stop doing without creating dangerous shortages in other places? Only because of that decentralization could they scale up production that quickly. And yet we did have dramatic shortages. And why was that? We still have shortages in many places. That's because governments uh, acting forcefully said that we have to make sure that no dangerous and insufficient face masks enter the market. So they blocked all the marketing of new uh, face masks and new protective equipment on the market. So while hospitals were screaming because th for any kind of protective equipment, there were factories that had stocks of unsold, hundreds of thousands, millions of face masks unsold because they weren't allowed to market them on uh, on the internet, on online uh, media. So we shouldn't ask governments what they can do for us. We should ask what do they do to us to make it more difficult to improvise when the crisis is at hand. Exactly, because I think what happened, uh, obviously Sweden was a sort of a different uh, example because uh, right on the onset of the beginning of how the government start to deal with the pandemic. We saw that the, uh, especially in the, after that uh, famous report that was launched by uh, a British university, I don't 
I think it was Cambridge, if I'm not wrong. It, uh, yeah, Im Imperial College study. Yeah, Imperial College, exactly. Yeah, that one. Yeah. That, that infamous study and that was the, 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 the initial reports in Italy that a lot of people were dying at the hospitals and they had to start to almost, uh, they basically had to start choosing who they were going to take care of and who they were basically uh, letting uh, allow to die because the situation was so dire. And uh, exactly what was said was, okay, so we need to make the lockdowns and uh, what the lockdowns will allow us to do is to um, create a, a sort of interval of time so we can all uh, markets, uh, companies, uh, governments can uh, understand the situation, assess what's going on, and then we can respond accordingly. But I think that what happened was that after that interval, in most cases, the, the companies and the markets were already way ahead than the governments were. I don't know if you noticed that too. Yes, uh, that's, that's definitely the, the case. Uh, that study was interesting, just a brief uh, interval, because it said, when you apply that to Sweden's situation, it said that we need an immediate lockdown in Sweden because otherwise, at the peak of infections, 20 people would fight over every hospital bed. We would have a 20-fold bigger demand for intensive care units in Sweden than, than otherwise. Sweden never entered lockdowns. Um, instead, social distancing was a recommendation. If you can avoid going to work and if you can work from home, please do it. If you can avoid public transportation, please do it. But there was not a ban. Uh, we didn't shut down schools or anything like that. And what happened was that Swedes voluntarily uh, social distanced in, uh, to a large uh, extent and slowed down the transmission. So even at the peak of transmissions, uh, there was still an extra capacity in of intensive care units of around 20%. So apparently this study didn't take into account that people change their behavior uh, when, when the situations change. It's not that you have to constantly be, be told and commanded what, uh, what to do. And um, the, the study said that we would have had uh, in the first three months, 100,000 deaths in Sweden. Uh, but it was at that stage, it wasn't even close to 5,000 uh, deaths. So I think we should be a little bit worried about those uh, not leaning too hard on studies that just try to project how people will behave by assuming that people are robots that just haven't a programming from uh, the past and they will just venture out into the world as it if nothing had happened, just like businesses, they constantly improvise. Uh, see, obviously, of course, that's a, a major point in our uh, classical liberals try to, to defend how basically society works in a more complex way than sometimes even the academy uh, thinks it works because also here in Portugal, we, have, we had a lot of uh, catastrophic, uh, catastrophic uh, provisions about how we, the number of, of infected will be was, was going to skyrocket and it will be the Armageddon in in a few weeks time so and we, I think that also in a way created a bigger need for government intervention and if we have a society that's essentially in a, a short period of space being told constantly that uh, if you don't do nothing a lot of people are going to die obviously you, you don't want to to see your, your uh, grandparents going to the hospital and have a, a breathing problem and probably, and probably die. And, and if you don't do nothing, we always have to do something, right? It almost seems yep. that uh, not, not doing something is, is almost evil in nature because we are just allowing things to happen and people to be to involved in chaos and, and be in peril. Uh, so uh, in that case, uh, I think you touched um, uh, interesting point about the Imperial College study. How do you see the, the role of uh, public um, official, not public officials, but in the public academics and intellectuals in the in the, the all this process of informing the, the public and uh, telling us to, what are the best decisions to do? 
Well, I think the role they should have is to um, stick to the data and to the research and talk uh, frankly and openly about what they think about things uh, rather than becoming something that often happens, becoming cheerleaders for one policy or another and uh, constantly just uh, looking at the parts of their data that supports a particular line. And it doesn't depend on which line this is. I, th I think it's dangerous when intellectuals and uh, scholars become too much tied to a political project, uh, whatever it, it is. And, and I think we've seen that when it comes to COVID-19. Um, some became, I think the problem is often that the government, the state is stupid and it has to be a little bit stupid because it is telling everybody what to do. And when you do that, you have to focus on very simple objectives, very simple rules by, by nature. You, you can't have too many different distractions uh, by then, but there is something inherently dangerous and stupid about it because it means that you only focus on one problem at the time. For example, now you could only focus on how do we reduce the transmission of COVID-19 and that's a worthy goal. We should try to minimize that. But then what happens is that you forget that there are other goals in society as well. There are goals like making sure that kids get an education and do not fall behind, that families are not stuck in uh, homes with uh, resulting and, and often individuals isolated with resulting mental illnesses, domestic abuse. Uh, the fact that um, we also need an economy functioning so that we produce more wealth so that we can invest in more scientific research, research of new medical drugs and more to healthcare in the long run making sure that uh, we have uh, a constant uh, ongoing uh, healthcare functioning for other conditions as well. Uh, to take just one data point during this uh, disease, some 26 countries abandoned vaccinations against measles. And there is a risk that that one thing alone might result in more disease and deaths and not just for the old, but for the youngest, for children around the world, then COVID-19 has as a whole. So, and, and just to, to take the economic part of it, um, the biggest problem will probably be that uh, 100 million people have been thrown back into extreme poverty and hunger around the world as a result of shutdowns of economies, loss of incomes, loss of jobs, loss of production. And we have to take that into consideration as well. And that is what individuals do when we are free to look at our individual situation. We worry about COVID-19 and we do whatever we can to protect ourselves, our loved ones and our older uh, relatives. But we also worry about the education of our kids and of um, a loss of income that might result in, in hunger for people. But governments can't do that. That's the problem where they only focus on one goal at the time. They forget all that local individual need and local knowledge. And that's why I think that it's the role of public intellectuals and researchers to remind ourselves that a dynamic functioning society with uh, decent opportunities for all take more goals into consideration than just one at the time. That's a, an actual uh, interesting point because we have we are having a lot of, of discussion about what are the the, eff the effects of the, the lockdowns in most countries that had uh, practiced them. Obviously, there's the the problem of economic uh, not to say collapse, but of economic uh, di economic dire consequences, especially for the the poor. Uh, but I would ask you to lean uh, if you could lean lean on. Do you do you have already? Uh, data that show us the, the, the dire consequences of the choices that were taken uh, during the, the, the reaction to the COVID pandemic? Well, there is uh, definitely data on a, a global level to begin with, or different scenarios about it. Traditionally, we know, uh, World Bank researchers have shown that around 80 to 90% of the cost of 
epidemics generally do not come from the disease in itself. Horrible though it is, disease and death and the ensuing lack of production, education in the future, that's just around 10 to 20 percent of, uh, of, the, of the problem. Most of it comes from aversion behavior, the fact that we stay away from one another, from workplaces, from mobility, from trade. This time around, it's even worse because the lockdowns have been even more dramatic. And uh, some of the earliest um, projections, they talk about how uh, potentially around 100 million people are being thrown back into extreme poverty as a result of that aversion behavior. And, uh, and, and that's, that's the, the biggest disaster. But then you can also look, look locally at, and regionally how far did countries go in their shutdowns, in their lockdowns? What did you do in, in, uh, within countries? Uh, how much of a state of emergency did you have there? And there's a, we have yet to see specific uh, data, but so far there's a very strong correlation uh, about, of uh, uh, drastic shutdowns and an ensuing loss of, uh, well, not just um, incomes, and, uh, but also longer term loss of uh, life incomes for kids who have not been uh, to schools uh, for, for a very long time. And that's something that they will probably never be able to make up for. So we are going to live with, uh, with the consequences of that for a very long time. Uh, Ivan, I don't know if you're very uh, short on time. Uh, I think we are approaching the 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 time limit that we have established i'll probably be, probably will only make you another question uh probably we have time for that okay probably one more question or maybe two if if, if you if you answer shortly uh you're also uh I, i've seen a lot of your work and you're you're very uh focused also on combating uh what can be said uh, called the political extreme extremism either it's on the right or on the left. Uh, do you think that the COVID pandemic and the, the reaction that states had to the, the COVID pandemic had some effects on uh, bolstering these, uh, po these extremisms in either sides? Yes, unfortunately, I think it does. And, uh, and you're quite right. I fear statism and, and populism of the left and on the right. And I consider them very much like two sides of the same coin, because what they're both afraid of is complexity. They're afraid of a complex world where millions of people interact with another voluntarily and uh, globally, constantly. They're both afraid of it, but traditionally, uh, the populist on the right, they fear it, so they want to shut that away from themselves. They want to hide away from it, building walls against that complexity. Whereas the left, they're also afraid of complexity. So they want to be in charge of it and try to command it and design it to, to make sure that it functions in a stable, orderly way. And both miss out on the basic fact of uh, that I've learned from history that it's only complexity. It's only individual local knowledge and experiments that create the wonders, the economic growth, the uh, technological and uh, business innovations that solve our problems and make the world safer for, for all of us. The problem with the pandemic, I think, one of the problems of the pandemic when we talk about political consequences is that it has reinforced a fear of the world. The world seems even more dangerous when we now have all these microbes out there uh, threatening us and our very lives. And historically, that tends to encourage those who say that let's protect ourselves then. Let's uh, look for the strong man and the strong government that will protect us against that and try to um, design uh, protections uh, against that world. So I fear that in uh, this will be a push for those forces, even though I think that's a major mistake. I think it's very counterproductive because what we have learned is that the things that keep us safe, ramping up production of protective equipment, coming up with a, a vaccine at the shortest, uh, quickest pace uh, ever, uh, making sure that supply chains are rerouted so that we have suddenly food on our shelves, even though the world basically shut down. All of that came from that complex 
seemingly chaotic world of entrepreneurs and eccentrics and foreigners constantly coming up with new ideas. Uh, so I think there's a strong case against this sort of uh, statist uh, policy, but I think that nonetheless, those that instinct, that fear will be strong there. So I think we're heading for a strong uh, struggle, strong fight between open and closed, between liberal ideas and more uh, statist ideas. So before, uh, I'm just going to push you a little bit before you go, because in, in, in honesty, you're a very interesting person to have to talk with, uh, talk with and you're, you're making a lot of great points. So trying to wrap in this up, um, uh, our conversation has been mostly about uh, the how, it, how difficult it is to defend complex, decentralized, uh, uh, freedom-based systems against the uh, political arguments of either the the left and the far left and the far right that defend, as you said, that complexity has to be combated in a way that uh, asks for more control and more uh, uh, of authority. So uh, what I was going to ask is to wrap up in his way. Is, do you believe, and I think this is the last, and I promise you the last question. So do you believe that uh, despite the data, despite the, the arguments and despite the the rationality that the, the how, how do you explain that uh, so many uh, side uh, not so many sides but both these sides they still cling to this almost old-fashioned idea that we need more state we need more government that capitalism may work in in times of peace but what what we need in the times of need is state do you think this is uh, I don't know political malfeasance the political bias almost a, a a necessity to ignore uh, simply data? Well, actually, I, uh, I find it sad, uh, but I also think it's understandable because I think that's part of our human nature. It's, uh, you know, we, we are human beings who have evolved during much more dangerous circumstances than we're in now. Uh, it, it's only been some 200 years that we've built the society of, to a, strong, a large degree, uh, wealthy, healthy. We've increased uh, life expectancy from 30 years to more than 70 years. We've reduced extreme poverty around the world from 90% to 9%. All of this because of more open societies and more free markets. But that is brand new. Uh, that's not where our instincts and our fears and our belief systems come from. They come from an era of hundreds of thousands of years of prehistory when we lived very close to uh, subsistence and a, fear of, of constant destruction uh, on the savannah from predators and other tribes. And I think whenever we become afraid of the world, this kicks in, this immediate fear that someone's got to protect us. Where is the big guy with the big guns who can protect us against uh, this danger? It is natural that it happens in times of crisis. And that's why we have to count to 10 and sort of calm down, make a rational analysis of the situation about what keeps us safe and what doesn't. And that's why it's so important that you and I and everybody who's convinced by economics, by history, by um, our, our political principles to understand the power of what people do when they're free, to remind people, especially in times of crisis, that we are not being kept safe by one guy in charge pointing us all in a particular direction. Because the risk is that he points us in the wrong direction. The risk is that we are substituting the knowledge of all those millions of people with just one or a couple of people uh, at the top. Uh, so it is understandable. That's why the work is difficult, but that's why it's so necessary to do it, especially when, uh, when it doesn't uh, uh, seem like it. To remind people of the things that they they take for granted the fact that the economy mostly uh, functions and produces results, even though it's not commanded from the top, because it's easy to ignore the fact that we've seen the fastest 
improvement in human living standards that the world has ever seen, reducing extreme poverty by around 140,000 people every day over the last 25 years. And that only happened in, in places that become more free, not in places where the big government was in charge. Yeah, well, I'm not going to abuse more of your time. Uh, we are extremely thankful of your presence here. It was the most interesting conversation and I think it will be very helpful to even to our Portuguese followers and sympathizers to hear your words and your ideas. So we have nothing to say more than just thank you. And uh, we hope to see you again in the future. Thank you very much and good luck with your important work. Thank, uh, and good luck for your work too, because it's also very important uh, to have public intellectuals that actually point us in the right direction, and not in the direction of, of more government and more and more and more uh, state incursions in our lives. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'll keep it up. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Jorn. Bye. Bye.